Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kelly McManus, and I lead our community partnerships and events here at the University of Waterloo. The University of Waterloo is so proud to be part of our community and to host these community talks that allow us to stay connected throughout the pandemic. During uncertain times, access to the facts is especially important, and we're delighted to bring our researchers right to your homes to share their expertise and answer your questions. Today is the final talk in our six week series, Ask Our Experts, COVID-19 Community Talks. A special welcome back to all of our returning attendees and any alumni who may be joining us. We're so pleased to have so many of you return week after week to engage in these sessions. And even though this week's series is wrapping up today, we are back next with the first of our two part series in partnership with CBC Kitchener Waterloo. Prior to the pandemic, we launched a series with uh, CBC called Beyond the Headlines. Some of you may have attended our first lecture. We're pleased to bring back this popular series, this time online. Our first lecture will be next Wednesday, June 17th at noon. Our panel of University of Waterloo researchers will be discussing globalization in our post-COVID world. Craig Norris from CBC Radio 1, 89.1 Kitchener-Waterloo will be moderating this lecture, and he'll be joined by experts in economics, political science, and tourism. Our second community lecture will be on July 15th at noon, our panel of Waterloo researchers will discuss responding to inequity in our post-COVID world. Craig Norris from CBC will once again be moderating the discussion and will discuss issues related to gender, race, and income inequality. And I'm sure you'll agree that both of these topics are very timely and indeed ripped right from the headlines. For more information and to register for these free online talks, please visit uwaterloo.ca slash community. We acknowledge that we live and work on the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabeg and Haudenosaunee peoples. The University of Waterloo is situated on the Haldeman Tract, the land promised to the Six Nations that includes 10 kilometers on either side of the Grand River. I turn things over to today's moderator, a quick reminder about housekeeping items for today. To change the layout of this video chat, hover over the gray button in the top right hand corner of the video screen. If you have any questions for our speaker, and we hope you do, please direct them to all panelists using the Q&A panel on the right side of your screen. If you're having technical difficulties, feel free to message the host directly via chat. And a reminder that today's session, like all others, is being recorded. You can visit our University of Waterloo YouTube channel to watch any of the first five talks. It's now my great pleasure to introduce Bob Lemieux, who is the Dean of the Faculty of Science at the University of Waterloo. Bob will be our host for today. Welcome, Bob. Thank you, Kelly, and uh, welcome to everyone uh, in this uh, sixth and final installment of our Ask Our Expert Community Talk. Uh, I'm the Dean of Faculty of Science. It's going to be my pleasure to uh, moderate today's uh, presentation. So uh, for those of you who are new to this format, to this uh, talk, uh, let me just go through uh, how we're going to proceed. Uh, first, our presenter, Dr. Roderick Slavchev. Uh, we'll present the topic for a couple of minutes, and then uh, he and I will uh, have a more in-depth uh, conversation on the theme that he will be presenting. And then after that, we will open up uh, the, uh, the session to questions from our audience. I'll be picking from questions that were already submitted by uh, some of our audience, and then we will also go through some uh, live questions. And as Kelly says earlier, please remember to direct all of your questions to the all panelist uh, seg section of the Q&A panel and not the chat panel. So it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, one of my colleagues in the faculty of science, uh, Dr. Roderick Slatchev, uh, who is a professor in the School of Pharmacy, and he is leading a project to develop a DNA-based non-invasive 
uh, COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, he is an expert in molecular biology, virology, and technology transfer. He's also the director of the Science Innovation Hub and has founded uh, numerous drug de uh, delivery research companies, uh, some of which are supporting his vaccine development research. So without further ado, I'll invite uh, Roderick to uh, give a, uh, his uh, short uh, initial presentation and then we'll, uh, we'll have some more uh, conversation with him. Roderick. Thanks so much, Bob. Uh, thank you, everybody. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I guess to start off, I mean, today's session is going to be on vaccines and uh, how they fit into the pandemic response. And when I think of uh, COVID-19 and the impact that it's had, the one word that comes to mind is unprecedented. And this is across numerous fronts. Obviously, medically, we're up at 7.3 million cases, hundreds of thousands of, of unfortunate deaths. Economically, the toll being somewhere between five and eight trillion as an estimate, psychological impact, obviously just being uh, housed and the quarantining situation, a lot of fear and uncertainty around when this, when we can get back to normal and when all of this is going to be over. And the interesting part here is that when we think about where medicine is today, we have a very personalized approach to this and we are leading more and more towards the concept of precision medicine and how we treat individuals and come along a pandemic as such and of global proportions. And this all flips completely on its head. And now it becomes a public health concern and not so much about the me, but about the us and much more of a utilitarian approach. Now in the past, we may have thought about vaccines and everyone has perhaps their own viewpoint on these. But the thing about vaccines is it's very easy to overlook them or even start thinking about the, you know, is the risk of a one in 100,000 or one in 10,000 of a potential side effect worth it? And that's easy when you don't really see the disease in front of you, which is a really means a testament that it, it's working. And in the case of a pandemic as such, uh, with, with potential dire consequences and where we don't have a cure, vaccines, of course, have come back to surface and an important topic for discussion. Um, I just want to give you a little bit of a sideline on where are the potential vaccine candidates at present. And if we were to, and this is one of the links that was provided, the World Health or World Health Organization has a running tally of the current vaccines that are in development. And they're currently, at least from the last time I checked, 102 candidates at present. And these fall into a variety of candidates. Some are far more conventional and have been around for 50, 50 years or so um, in how we have gone about trying to treat infectious disease. Um, and others are a little bit more novel, and I just want to get a little bit into these. So some of your more conventional are what are known as whole killed viruses. In this case, either through tr chemical treatment or through heat treatment, these viruses are killed and they are unable to replicate. And as a result, they can allow for a type of immune response to form upon administration to individuals. Usually side effects are associated with this are not too severe and usually something like a headache or potential fever just from the inflammation that can be caused. Other more conventional approaches are known as attenuated live vaccines. And these are very, very weakened forms of the viruses that are pathologic or pathogenic. And in this respect, they are able to grow very slowly and very poorly. And in so doing can actually confer the proper type of immune response and can be quite effective. Um, and another approach is a subunit vaccine. Usually this is something that is on the surface of the vaccine, which coronavirus would be known as a spike protein. Um, to generate a humoral or an antibody type of response that is hopefully able to bind and to neutralize this virus upon subsequent exposure to the actual virus. Um, less conventional approaches are known as genetic vaccines, which, in, which would uh, also be a component of what we were working on. In this case, this can be either DNA or RNA that can encode some element or some viral element, which is important in mounting the right type of an immune response to provide that protection. Uh, alternate types of vectors, which could be something like adenovirus or common cold, which again can be attenuated, can be allowed to grow within the human host, but in so doing also will present some component of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, vaccine, or sorry, SARS-CoV-2 virus, and hopefully mount the response against that as well. And then there are alternate forms that would come, one of which, which is of relevance here, known as a virus-like particle, which is essentially the virus, but it's a shell it's completely safe in that it absolutely cannot replicate because it has no genetic material whatsoever. And so it resembles the form and structure of a virus and can generate some relatively strong immune responses, 
but is a highly safe approach. And then there are other alternative approaches, which we won't so much go into, but uh, also have a role to play here. So I think with that, we'll, we'll end off and start looking at how we can uh, address some of the questions of how vaccines really play a role in, uh, in COVID-19 pandemic. Great, thanks. Thanks, Roderick. So what would you say are the attributes of a good vaccine against COVID-19? Uh, that's a very important question. Um, there are three primary pillars that we have to look at, and this really goes for all therapeutics. Uh, that, that is safety, of course, being first and foremost, uh, the efficacy of the, of the vaccine to ensure that it works. And the third, which is particularly relevant also to COVID-19 being a global crisis, is the manufacturability or the accessibility of a vaccine of such. So from a safety perspective, this means obviously that the response uh, widely spread across uh, numerous individuals would be, would be the appropriate type of response, and we'll leave efficacy for a second, but would be safe to at whatever dose is, is defined as the proper dose, usually generated during preclinical trials. Um, the next most important piece to, to address with safety is that this is a little bit of an odd duck of a virus, and there are a few other viruses that act the same way as SARS and SARS-CoV-2. These are respiratory syncytial virus, to some extent HIV, um, and Zika virus and dengue virus. And what that means, the, the problem with these is that they can lead to an unregulated type of an immune response, something that's known as immune enhancement. And this is a very, a very sort of unfortunate backfiring of an immune response that can be generated, not only by the virus itself and upon subsequent exposures to different serotypes, but also even by the vaccine itself. And it can even facilitate or exacerbate disease. So these are really, really important points that for a vaccine like this need to be addressed. The other point, of course, is effectiveness. It has to generate a neutralizing antibody response. That is an, an antibody response that can bind to the virus and completely neutralize it, block its ability to be infected. Another approach to this would be to be durable. And durability here would be, uh, of course, an amazing asset in that it wouldn't be just against SARS-CoV-2, but against other subsequent exposures of SARS-CoV-3 and whatever might be in the pipeline, you know, coming down the pipeline uh, for, for subsequent uh, epidemics. Okay. And sorry, and the, and the last part is the manufacturability along this line, which uh, is really important to, to ensure that the, uh, the scalability is there. Is it even possible to generate that many doses? This is particularly relevant to some of the, the viral and protein approaches, which may be very expensive to generate, and we may not even have the manufacturing facilities to do so. Okay, thanks for that. Um, so there are so many uh, vaccines that are currently in development worldwide, and, and you're part of that uh, that process and you're in that race. Uh, what, what makes your vaccine stand out relative to all these others that are in development? Well, thanks for asking. <laughs> um, th that's a, a really important question. I mean, given everything that I've said about safety and efficacy and the manufacturability, we took all of these in consideration and came out, which we believe is a, is a strong strategy moving forward. It's a little bit unique but does draw together different approaches. The best way to describe it is something that we call synthetic infection. And what that means is we're trying to simulate how a SARS-CoV-2 would actually infect everything from root of infection being inhaled to the primary site and target of what the virus would be attacking, which is the lower respiratory tract tissues, primary uh, infection site, and to try and generate a local response, an immune response, which is most pertinent dealing with an intracellular pathogen such as SARS-CoV-2 or, or virus of this nature. And there's a lot of data to suggest that this type of root of infection, for instance, inhale, in, inhalation and localizing to the actual site is very pertinent and very effective against respiratory um, types of uh, pathogenic uh, uh, ideological agents. Now, in our case, this falls into the category of a DNA vaccine. So we have a very, very effective and extremely safe, possibly the safest approach to deliver DNA to cells of the human, of, uh, human uh, body. And upon delivering this DNA very effectively, and so as high as up to a 97% uh, efficiency of this delivery process, once we get the genetic cargo to these cells of interest, then we would generate something, as I mentioned before, called a virus-like particle. The virus-like particle is just a shell 
It's a shell of a virus. And the importance of this is that DNA vaccines are really good at T cell or cell mediated immune responses. That's like recognizing infected cells and getting rid of them before they can generate more viruses. But the humoral or antibody response tends to be a little lower for DNA vaccines. But by the generation of this virus-like particle that then leaves these cells and not only can bind to other potential sites of infection for SARS-CoV-2 and can be therapeutic, but also mount a, a very strong uh, antibody response at the same time. So we're combining different strategies together. And the hope around this is that we not only have a safe or the safest approach, but also highly efficacious and very, very potentially therapeutic as well. The manufacturability of DNA, we can make bucket loads of this stuff and we can do so, so quite quickly. And that's a really important part to, to trying to address a global crisis such as this. So one of the things that people don't necessarily think about is that there's so many groups around the world working night and day to develop this vaccine. And, but at some point, one of them will cross the finish line and, and will be commercialized and, and will be used. Um, I guess, you know, one of the question is, what happens to all these other vaccines that didn't make the cut? I mean, was, was all this work wasted or uh, is there going to be value in the work that uh, was carried out that uh, that didn't quite make the cut? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I get that. I get that quite a bit. <laughs> um, and hopefully it will be your vaccine, Roderick. Well, I, I would hope so. The, the I, I hope so as well. well. But I mean, there, there's much more to that story. Um, Notwithstanding everything that I mentioned about safety, efficacy, and manufacturability, those are three tough pillars to hit for one vaccine to do all three. Um, and more importantly, perhaps, is that there's no time in history where there's been more of a focus on vaccine development, at least not in mine. Um, and in this time, I think we have a very a, a rich approach by which we're going to be generating new platforms, not just for SARS-CoV-2, but potentially for other SARS and other epidemics in the future of the SARS nature, but other infectious diseases and even, even uh, cancer vaccines and other therapeutic vaccines that may be delivered from this. Now, the other important part about this is that vaccines have a very high failure rate particularly for a tricky virus such as SARS and SARS-CoV-2, where there's a potential for inflammation in the lungs, backfiring of immune responses. So that safety piece is a really critical piece as well, as well as what I mentioned on the manufacturability front and being able to address the need of, a, of the entire globe. Um, so taking all of these into, into consideration, the 102 that are present, you can expect, you can expect a, quite a reasonable failure rate. And that's just, that's just how it works. Um, the conventional approaches may not be so effective in the in the uh, the application here directly to SARS-CoV-2, particularly for the immune enhancement components. And some of your newer approaches, while they may take longer to get to uh, into the hands or into the clinics and into patients, may be a little bit more, I guess, well tuned towards what are the potentials of addressing this actual infectious disease. So, so is it fair to say that uh, a, a particular vaccine may be very effective uh, in one particular population group, but not in others? And is, is that why it is important to have a diversity of vaccines? Absolutely. That, that is, a, that is a, a very important point. And it really depends on what is the platform technology driving that type of vaccine. So for instance, something like a subunit vaccine, which could be just one viral protein that's been isolated and you expect to generate an immune response or protective response with that, those are generally very safe. You may have some very mild side effects that would come with it, but they're quite safe. There's no replicative potential, no ability of spreading a virus. So your, your age groups for which those could be considered to be effective are, are quite large versus, but they, they also may be limited in their efficacy. Um, others, which may be far more efficacious and also durable across other different strains, like attenuated viruses, for instance, they're still capable of replication and there's still a potential even for genetic events to occur to recombine into a live virus. That is still a potential. So these viruses have to be in immune competent individuals and will not include your, your younger children or, uh, or your elderly population mm -hmm. may be immunocompromised and not be able to handle those types of vaccines. Okay. Wonderful. This is a great way to set the stage, Roderick. So what we're going to do now is move on to our questions from our audience. And, and I'm going to start with uh, a question that was submitted earlier. Um, and the question is, what is the most challenging aspect of developing a vaccine for COVID-19? 
I'd say the most important ones that, that come to mind right now are, first of all, the urgency behind this. We do not have the timeline that would be present for vaccines that can take upward of 30 to 35 years. I mean, if you look at HIV, we're 35 years and still we do not have a vaccine. So it can be very, very dependent on the type of infectious disease. SARS-CoV-2 is a tricky virus. Um, that has this potential for immune enhancement. And as such, I think that you'll see some of your newer vaccine approaches that are much better um, designed to address some of these challenges. And possibly the most important part is still the manufacturability. Locking in the supply chain to be able to address this in a timely manner mm -hmm. is, is really important. Getting manufacturers, which might be large scale, but still not large scale enough, to be able to generate enough of the vaccine to be able to dose in a, in a rapid response. So some of your genetic vaccines in this respect might be better able to address this. The other approach is on the clinical side and being able to test this appropriately and rapidly um, within, within a, a suitable population to be able to address the safety and efficacy around this. In a lot of cases, this is with healthcare workers that are normally exposed to the virus and locking in that element of the value chain and supply chain is also challenging. So there are a number of challenges at work and all the feverish work that's going on with just the science side has to address some of these business concerns as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question, uh, how does a non-invasive vaccine work and why did you pursue this route? There are a number of reasons actually. Um, Interestingly, the one that most people like being non-invasive and obviously, you know, safer and perhaps not even you don't need a healthcare professional to necessarily administer. That's one of the lowest reasons for it. The, the two other most important reasons are that the route of infection in this case is a, is a nasal delivery can be very effective at activating the right type of an immune response and immune cells to be able to generate a a very efficacious response toward a viral infection such as uh, SARS-CoV-2. And the second one is to have a localized approach. As I mentioned, this concept of a simulated um, infection. So if we use this synfection type of a strategy, we want it to be localized to the lungs where SARS-CoV-2 would normally be infective. And because our vaccine has a therapeutic potential and by so it can bind to the actual receptors of SARS-CoV-2 and block those and competitively inhibit um, SARS-CoV-2 from, from being able to bind, we want those to be localized to the same tissue that would be the primary site of infection of SARS-CoV-2. Great. Okay, so let's move on to uh, a question from our audience uh, live, and that is from Susan S. And she's asking, uh, for people who have a suppressed immune system, what are the implications for them receiving a potential COVID vaccine? Um, as, as I mentioned earlier, there are different types of vaccines that have different levels of safety. And often this type of safety is balanced against the efficacy profile as well. So subunit vaccines, for instance, in this case, very often you'll see spike type proteins that might be generated. The spike is the attachment protein that recognizes receptor on cells um, to be able to generate a neutralizing antibody response against that receptor that binds to it and prevents either the attachment or the fusion with the membrane of these cells is a neutralizing response and can be generated with a, uh, with a subunit vaccine, which would be like a protein of just that virus. These are generally safe, have very low side effects that are usually associated with them. Um, and in so doing might be better for a more immunocompromised or not yet immune developed population versus some of your more, I wouldn't say risky, but um, some of your other types of strategies like attenuated viruses, which require proper immune uh, competent um, background in order to be effective and especially safe. Okay, uh, there's another question uh, from our audience, uh, and it goes back to uh, something you talked about uh, with respect to supply chain. Does Canada have the manufacturing capability for COVID-19 vaccine? Um, I would say nationally, we are, we are in pretty good shape to address what our national population needs uh, at present. That being said, there's a lot of work to continue to increase this. On the more global economic scale, this is something which is being recognized as a real need and potentially a really strong learning uh, point for, for all nations to pour in a lot of the public money toward those manufacturing facilities to ensure that we have the, the right infrastructure in place for the next time that something like this might occur. 
Uh, but it's hard for me to say, given that I'm not a, definitely an expert in that area on the manufacturing side, but we, we seem to be in, in reasonable shape to be able to address what is the national need. Okay. All right, let's go back to uh, the questions that were submitted previously. Um, are there concerns that the global expediency of COVID-19 might compromise safety and ethical concerns, particularly in developing countries or contexts where uh, research ethics board review and other oversights is not prioritized? That is a, that is a very insightful question. <laughs> Um, I'm going to give you my perspective on this and just, I guess, uh, ensure that this is my viewpoint on this. Mm -hmm. I do believe that the urgency component of, of what is occurring right now, and obviously there is an urgency to this, to, to try to deliver a vaccine that is going to be efficacious, but efficacy should never take the place of safety. Um, and in some of these current scenarios, I say there are some cutting corners that are occurring, which may lead to some safety concerns. Uh, for instance, there are some groups that are skipping preclinical studies entirely, moving directly into clinical studies and straight into humans for, for their trials. I think that uh, there's a lot to be learned from the preclinical studies, even, for instance, how to go about starting those human clinical trials, which needs to be taken into consideration some of the more, I'd say, disturbing um, trends on the horizon right now are the concept of even challenging individuals once they've been vaccinated with SARS-CoV-2 um, under close personal care, just to be able to see, you know, what is the efficacy and safety component that, that uh, occurs di directly. Of course, the, the upside to that is it's much quicker. You'll know within a few weeks. The downside to it is, of course, ethical reasons and ethical concerns around this. If you look at the original vaccine from Edward Jenner for, for smallpox and vaccinia vaccination of a young child, that was how it was originally done, was to just challenge with smallpox directly after. I'd like to think we've come a long way since then um, on our on our ethics, on how we go about uh, our therapeutics. And while urgency is, of course, a consideration, we do have to be mindful that safety is should be our primary priority. Thank you, that's a good point. Uh, let's see now, uh, back to our live audience. Uh, do you expect COVID-19 vaccine to be redesigned every year, similar to flu vaccines? That is a, it's a tough question to answer because it will depend on what are found to be the most important strategies or platforms that are efficacious and safe against COVID-19. If we find that the safest approaches are those that are what are called um, univalent or just a single valency or a single potential antigen site um, for the virus, then yes, that is a, a possibility that they like the flu vaccine, it would have to be engineered every year. Uh, the other approach, um, for instance, is that we have a multivalent vaccine, something that's far more universal. And if it's more universal and tends to be safe as well as efficacious against SARS-CoV-2, then there's a very strong potential that that durability will last against subsequent serotypes or subsequent further epidemics of SARS, not just SARS-CoV-2, but potentially SARS-CoV-3, 4, and even other types of human coronaviruses. So here's a good follow-up question on that one. Uh, what if the virus mutates too much before completion of the vaccine? Are we back to square one? Um, likely not. So it, it, it depends, again, on what type of vaccine strategy is the one that makes it forward. If it's something that, for instance, is a whole virus type approach, um, then you're going to have elements that are always going to be conserved in nature between different viruses, even if there is this, this mutation or genetic drift that may occur. And already, for instance, there has been mutations that have occurred since the original SARS-CoV-2 in China versus you know, what we find in the United States or even Canada at this point, and we can continue for that to occur. That being said, SARS-CoV-2 does not mutate at a, at a particularly high rate. So that's, that's a good news, I guess, component to this. But the types of vaccines that are really focusing on the conserved components between the, vac between the viruses will be particularly effective in promoting this type of durability between various strains and various serotypes. So in the same vein, again, now this is back to questions that were previously submitted. Uh, will this vaccine help boost our immune systems against other coronaviruses? Very possibly. So if we do make use of some of these conserved epitopes, and that's something that we've tried to adopt very closely in our own vaccine design, 
is to really make this particular um, uh, motif, which is highly conserved across all beta coronaviruses, if we can really induce that immunogenicity around that particular motif, then the hope is, is that we will get that type of a durable response, not only against SARS, SARS-CoV-2, um, Middle Eastern respiratory, uh, MERS, for instance, but also even potentially other human coronaviruses, you know, that could be even common cold. So here's one that's a bit more on the public health uh, side of things, but you know, let, let's, let's see what you can come up with. Uh, the flu vaccine is used by about 40% of the population in Canada, which is just barely enough to give us herd immunity. Given that the basic reproduction numbers of SARS-CoV-2 is so much higher, how do we ensure that enough people decide to get the vaccine that we can cross that same threshold? I have a few. Well, first of all, I mean, for herd immunity to be particularly effective, you're probably looking at numbers of 75 to 80 um, percent for it to be particularly effective. Um, you would think that, you know, when we think about something like even influenza, these are more vaccines that perhaps are more convenient. Yes, you know, they, they, they do deter, you know, economic impact of, of influenza and, and uh, potential downtime. But we never consider the, the influenza impacts across the in general population to be too severe. Um, and that might then play into how we look at vaccines and the need for them. As I mentioned, you know, vaccines is something we only consider to be really, really important when perhaps there is no cure. When there is a cure and you don't see the vaccine and you know, then you know it's working, but you can start to think that perhaps it's not of particular importance and even start to question whether it's worth the risks. Um, in a case like this, we do know that the severity or potential severity of COVID-19 is dire. And given that, I would hope that, uh, that the actual response toward getting vaccinated is, is stronger. Um, notwithstanding, of course, that we have to do our homework on the science side to ensure that these do meet all of the, the appropriate safety standards before they are released. So hopefully we won't reach that, that herd immunity part. Right. Okay, so we have time for one last question. And here it is. Uh, in the race for mass development of the polio vaccine in the United States back in the 50s, uh, where many children that were actually infected by a vaccine dose to errors in manufacturing, are odds very low of this occurring with COVID vaccines and which types of vaccines are considered the safest for the most vulnerable people with existing serious health concerns? Yeah, that, is a, that is a great question. Um, nothing, is, nothing is without risk. Um, th that would fall into the category of what are known as attenuated live viruses. So in this case, these are viruses which do work, but they've been mutated to uh, a point where they can grow very poorly. That being said, if there were, for instance, a co-infection or a genetic rearrangement, there is a potential for further mutation to occur that can restore these viruses to their full infective capacity. Um, I would say that the current attenuated viruses are so heavily mutated that the potential for any type of a restoration is so low that perhaps it's nil, but you know, it, I would never say the chance is zero. Mm -hmm. To that, of course, there is that point that for these type of, of uh, approaches or genetic strategies, you do have to have the right immune competent individuals for these to be effective approaches. And that is something that we've also learned from scenarios like this. Well, Roderick, thank you so much for uh, your insightful comments. Uh, and uh, we certainly wish you the best of luck in uh, your own work in developing uh, a vaccine that will cross that finish line. We're, we're all rooting for you, Roderick. Uh, and, and I think it, it's it, your comments and insight have provided important information for people uh, because we need to really understand the issue of vaccine development, because it is it is critical and it will become even more critical as we move forward. So, again, thank you very much. Uh, and, and thank you to our audience uh, and for your questions. Uh, this, your engagement is very important and we appreciate that uh, you took the time today to uh, to listen to this. Um, so you will see uh, in the next slide that will be provided. Uh, and there it is. Uh, additional resources uh, for you to learn more about this topic. You can learn more about the COVID-19 vaccine candidates, what is happening with COVID-19 uh, therapeutics, including work that is happening here at University of Waterloo, and an article discussing how vaccines work and their various strategies. 
All of these links will also be posted in the chat. So you can go directly to these sites if you wish after today's talk. And of course, the recording of today's talks will be posted uh, on YouTube shortly. As Kelly mentioned in the beginning, we'll be hosting a new two part Beyond the Headlines online series in collaboration with CBC, where our University of Waterloo researchers will be discussing the realities unfolding in our post COVID world. So please go to uwaterloo.ca slash community for more information about all of our upcoming lectures. As we wrap up our COVID-19 Ask Our Experts Community Talks, we wanted to thank you all, uh, not only for attending to this, today's talk, but to thank you for uh, to all who have attended uh, multiple sessions. Uh, the response to this series has been overwhelming, and we want to thank you for your participation. We hope you can join us for our next lecture series behind uh, Beyond the Headlines online, and I wish you a wonderful day. Thank you and goodbye.